Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, I'd like to say thank you um, in two ways. One, for inviting me here at all. Um, and thank you also to everyone for uh, all your patience that my children are also here. And it's been a wonderful experience for us to be back in Hungary. Um, I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to myself. Um, this is, in a sense, a very personal lecture, but I hope it has uh, more general applications. Um, very briefly, as um, Adrian uh, kindly introduced me, um, I am a, a carpenter in the, uh, the English tradition. I'm also an architect, and I have several architecture degrees. Um, I um, would like to present my ideas of, of, of life and architecture to you, and I hope that it finds some interest. Um, in recent years, I have been not only a carpenter, but also a lime burner, so I produce building limes uh, in kilns, small-scale kilns. I studied at the University of Sheffield. Um, I worked for several years as an architect and a carpenter here in Hungary, um, partly with Sholomín Ferenc and Czernius Lörinc here in Budapest, not here in Budapest, in Budapest, um, I also worked with Estan Jüse, who is sitting quietly and modestly over there, um, in Csíkszerada in Transylvania. <coughs> um, I then moved back to England, having helped build a house designed by Imre Mokovets in Dobogorku. Um, but in England, I worked for a conservation architect in Oxfordshire, and also for uh, the great timber framer Peter McCurdy, who built the Globe Theatre in London, or I should say rebuilt the Globe Theatre in London. Um, I now run my own practice um, called Manifest, um, we design, we craft, we also own a small but significant ancient woodland in Western England, which we hope to turn into a, a source of sustainable timber and many other things besides. Um, I've always been deeply interested in what we are currently calling vernacular architecture or folk architecture. Um, I, uh, I realize that I'm stepping onto the podium directly after a professor <coughs> of architecture who has a, maybe a slightly different definition of what vernacular architecture actually is. Um, to me, I've always started from the point that is, and I quote, an unconscious production of form, which is a terribly problematic way of defining it, and I shall hopefully make it less problematic as we go through. But it's uh, perhaps a, a form which arises without a designer in some sense, certainly without a professional architect. But I realize this is exactly the conference where we can pick apart all of these terms. I want to know what hope is there for us as modern people, as architects, as designers, to somehow tap into what I think is the great the power, the strength, and the beauty of what we might call vernacular architecture in our modern designs. When I say modern, I mean that with a very small m, as in the designs we make today, not modernist. Um, to start, then, um, here is a, a picture which I have uh, painted myself. It doesn't look quite so good <coughs> on a large screen as it does in my sketchbook, if I may say so. Um, I've always been interested in the ideas, not so much of architecture, but of the context from which architecture emerges. Um, this is part of a, a long-distance walk which I have taken across uh, my own country of Britain, um, indeed of England. Uh, I have done several of these. Uh, I walk for miles and I walk for days, uh, knocking on doors uh, to find places to sleep because I I'm firmly believe that if I do not understand my own country, I cannot possibly build a building which works within it. Um, but I'd like to discuss some of the ideas of what we mean by context and how architecture, how building might actually arise from that um, in terms of the vernacular. So an obvious uh, uh, example is that of the physical context. So for instance, we have a tree. Uh, this is an oak tree. Um, as you can see, it's a very um, English form of oak tree where they tend to uh, grow in fields and uh, they will grow in a very, um, shall we say, wavy fashion. Um, and part of uh, the great tradition, in, uh, certainly in the English framing tradition of oak, um, is to be able to work with oak which is twisted and turn it into a building which works together but is by no means straight. This is a small building in Oxfordshire built of oak, uh, which I happen to work on. So that is one. That's a physical context. We have trees being turned into buildings. It all sounds really rather simple. However, let us uh, uh, imagine a different context, that of simply of technique, um, that one might be able to take a material such as uh, this, which is chalk, very soft, uh, not at all suitable for building with as building stone. And yet, if you burn it in a kiln, you can turn it into 
something more like this. The stone here is limestone, but the, the lime mortar which holds the stones together, or at least distributes the forces in the correct way, and the lime wash, which forms these beautiful uh, the white shells of the vault here in the church in Oxfordshire again, um, has been formed through the achieving of temperatures of 900 degrees centigrade for several hours, which is not that easy to achieve with a fire, uh, certainly a wood fire, um, and it has given us this technical context which itself has given rise to the possibility of buildings such as this. Um, a further context which I'd like to talk about in terms of vernacular architecture, um, not just a muddy pond made in clay soil, but one which you can take forward and turn into rather beautiful buildings which have their own spiritual purpose. So here is a building made of earth, believe it or not, um, this is in Cornwall, it's a Quaker meeting house, and yet being made of perhaps the most, what we might call the most gross of materials, the, the rudest, the most dirty of materials we have here, um, a building which, which proclaims its own uh, spiritual um, context uh, in the Quaker terms of, of quietness and contemplation. So we have here, I would say, the first point at which we're going to pick apart my definition of an unconscious uh, production of form in vernacular architecture, because I believe that being conscious is one of the very things that makes us human. And anything we look at that has ever been made by a human being has been done in some form of consciousness. But to me, the defining feature of vernacular architecture is not the fact that it was done without a designer, but the fact that it was uh, done with a certain amount of conscious choice within certain constraints whether those be physical constraints or technological constraints or indeed spiritual constraints. Um, you might almost say that we're talking about a mixture between, I hesitate to say constraint is unconscious, but let's say that we have unconsciousness and consciousness all mixed up together, perhaps even instinct and constraint mixed up together. Um, so for instance, just by way of an example of this, I'd like to show you a picture of a very bleak, perhaps, uh, but beautiful landscape in the north of Britain. This is in the Orkney Islands, on the island of Hoy. Uh, and then a picture of a building which is just to the left of this shot, taken by a good friend of mine, of a building which, which is almost entirely made out of the materials from which it founds its, finds itself uh, situated. Um, so one constraint, for instance, here is that nobody wants to drag a lot of stone a lot of places, so why not build from the stone that you have? The, the turf roof is from the turf uh, directly opposite it. It is, to me, one of the most beautiful buildings, um, and yet it, it cannot be said to be unconscious. The, the walls, the stones do not form themselves into walls all by themselves, and yet uh, here it is, one that, that to me fits very harmoniously into its landscape as an embodiment of what a vernacular building could be. This is actually quite a new building, I'd like to add. Um, in terms of, as I say, to, just to illustrate one more instance of this, uh, this, this consciousness um, in, as opposed to uh, unconsciousness or instinct, um, and this is no place, I'm afraid, for a detailed uh, exposition on the history of timber framing in England, but here is an example from the Chiltern Open Air Museum in southern England um, of, of a particular uh, form of our timber framing. It is a, a, a cruck building, uh, in case you wish to know, but it is, uh, if, you, if you care to look at the picture carefully, you can immediately see that there is a great deal of complexity within here, and you must take my word for it. I will show you other examples later on, that this is but one example of, of different kinds of timber framing. We compare this with, say, the animal architecture, which appears to be uniform uh, and uniform across several generations, and that animals, so far as anyone can see, um, build entirely on instinct. This is not to diminish their skills as builders, but the, the instincts which drive an animal to build uh, in the way that it does, whether it's a spider or a stork uh, or even a bowerbird, um, are somehow different to the way that humans do it. So I'd like to ask a very general question. Are humans, in any sense, a wild animal? Are we part of what we have been calling nature? Or uh, do we have any, in, uh, do we have any uh, access, I beg your pardon, to this sort of zero impact dwelling, which we might call the stork's nest? Or, alternatively, to take a different extreme, are we an alien species that doesn't really belong on this earth at all? Because otherwise, why are we doing so much harm? to the earth, and is there a middle way that we can find between being wild and being alien um, that we can embody in our buildings? Um, 
So in order to get our heads around some of this apparent paradox, I'd like to introduce a subject. I don't think it has been talked about at this conference before, but it, in English, at any rate, the first application of the word vernacular was not to building at all, it was to language. Now, language is something I find very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I speak several languages myself, and I found that it is always absolutely instrumental in learning to live in any particular culture, is to learn the language of it. It somehow teaches you more about the state of mind of the culture uh, than anything else. Uh, we live in language every day. Every single person I know speaks a language. Many may, may not read, but we all speak it. We are utterly immersed. And the point about language that I find particularly interesting is that no one person has designed it. We all, in a sense, design it. We all contribute to it. Um, and yet, it is full of subtlety, it is full of power, it is full of absolute ingenuity. If you consider any, any human language ever, the, the complexity of its grammar in many ways is utterly astounding, and yet no one invented it. Uh, it, it to me, it has some fascinating parallels with the idea of what vernacular architecture could be. Um, it is always, in some sense, the same. It is always developing, and yet it cannot develop so fast that people cannot understand it. It does not wish for what the modernists call a tabula rasa, a completely fresh start, because if you did that, it would suddenly lose all of its meaning uh, and all of its communicability. Committees, I may add, including the Académie Française, make very little difference to how a language actually evolves. Um, I'd like to compare that, of course, with modern architectural practice, um, and here, perhaps, um, uh, I do it coincide with some of your concerns, <laughs> Professor, um, um, in, in terms of what modern architectural practice has become with its, with its uh, individual architect sitting in one office but with immense power over the built environment, um, with a contractor, a main contractor, bound by contracts and specifications and drawings, a global trade and materials and currency, with most people given not really not very much choice over how they live and what they live in. Um, perhaps there is a model that we can see in, an, in the organic construct of language that gives us hope um, for an organic construct in architecture too. Um, can it be achieved from the top down? I don't know. And having just seen your presentation, I am going to show you the next slide, which I prepared, almost tongue-in-cheek, um, but a professor of mine at Sheffield suggested that the modern petrol garage was an instance of the vernacular. I don't know if he was being serious or not. Um, but perhaps ubiquity uh, and functionality may be one definition of a vernacular, um, but I'm not convinced myself. Um, it, it, it seems to lack something of what I would be looking for uh, in terms of what good architectural design is. Um, and perhaps we, here we have a great division between what is and what ought to be, um, and that is always something to say this is, perhaps this is vernacular architecture. I would ask the question, ought it to be vernacular architecture? At the other extreme, from the bottom up, of course, um, we have the, the favelas uh, which, which uh, exist in all sorts of uh, countries, mainly what we now call developing countries around the world. This is an example from the Philippines. Um, I have not studied the concept of the shanty town um, uh, to the extent that I would like to do. Um, I think this has as much integrity as, as any other example of vernacular architecture I can think of, even though it is built of cardboard and sheet metal. Um, my question would be, does it have the dignity that the people living here deserve? And again, here we are back to what is and what ought to be. I would like to know if we can say this ought not to be, but we, we can learn from the lessons which this uh, gives us in how spaces are shaped by ordinary people in the absence of a professional designer. Can we actually tap in, us, we, here, in this room, can we tap into uh, the sources of vernacular architecture, the contexts which have given rise not so much to something which, while full of integrity, is also full of poverty, but can we uh, tap into uh, the, the model of architecture which actually gives us the dignity and the integrity that we require? Almost a, a modern vernacular, you might say. We have also heard much about culture, and nature this morning, and doubtless on Monday. Um, it is my contention that all human culture springs from nature. Now, you may look at this and you say, well, here's an example where it doesn't, and I would agree. Um, I'm going to return once again to the example of uh, language and linguistics, which 
We're sometimes told all words are arbitrary and maybe all languages are arbitrary. They're simply convenient sounds that we use with each other to express something which we all understand, but outside of our human context it means nothing at all. Um, it's actually interesting to come across some phenomena, such as the fact that linguistic diversity and biodiversity in different areas of the globe actually follow each other rather closely. So the areas of most biodiversity are also the areas of most linguistic diversity. The famous example is um, Papua New Guinea, where there are 830 languages among 7 million people. Um, if we compare this to, uh, say, uh, perhaps there are many different contexts involved in this comparison, but to North Korea, where there are 24 million people and one language. Uh, and we might ask ourselves why this is. Um, there are many, perhaps there are many reasons, but it is the very landscape itself, it seems, in New Guinea, which with several isolated valleys, which is difficult to travel between. This leads not only to an isolation of uh, genetic mutations and therefore biodiversity, but also to the same model of linguistic diversity between human beings. We can't travel between the valleys and therefore the languages evolve differently. Um, some research even points, and I can cite the articles to you later if you would like to, between different phonemes, that is different sounds that humans make, may have evolved to be more or less useful in different climates. So for instance, in a cold climate, people tend to use more consonants um, because they will tend to be indoors more, whereas people who live outdoors in a more, shall we say, clement environment tend to use more vowels, which are useful for communicating over long distances. And here we might think of also even the extremes of, of yodeling in Switzerland or indeed the shouting that uh, uh, takes place across valleys uh, in, in uh, Cheek and these surrounding uh, areas. So I'd like just to return to this whole uh, apparent paradox between our, are we wild or are we alien? Clearly, we are natural creatures. We evolved here on Earth. So how do we explain something like this? The, direction, uh, the destruction, our consumption, our unsustainable development. <coughs> Would you say that it is perhaps the, the problem between us and the wild animals who do not do this is our consciousness itself? It's not a very comfortable question, I understand. And if vernacular architecture is in some sense an unconscious production form, is there hope there for us? in the same manner that language arrives as an unconscious production of sounds with meaning that we could actually learn to live uh, here on this planet. So I think we can posit a spectrum of our culture. Although everything arrives from nature, I think there are some places which are closer and some places which are further away. This is hardly controversial, but I'd just like to say it. Um, I think there is a new way that we can talk about where we are neither wild nor alien in terms of our building. Um, and I think that this, this, this new way lies in understanding our relationship with the world. And I say relationship with a stress, because I think that is entirely what it is. Um, I'd like to quote briefly from uh, my favorite philosopher, Mary Midgley, um, at the University of Newcastle, um, who's written a great deal about our relationship with the world. Um, she says, we need the vast world, and it must be a world that does not need us a world which is constantly capable of surprising us, a world we did not program since only such a world is the proper object of wonder. I'd like also to reference perhaps some rather romantic ideas of what the vernacular builders thought of the world, full of personality. It was not just other human beings who had personality, but almost every natural phenomenon was invested with some kind of personality. You might call it a spirit, but let's move on. Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, wrote a great deal about the relationship with the other, or two different kinds of relationship. One with a simple object, which he called I, it, so me and it, and the other one, I, thou, a slightly archaic one, I and you, me and you, which is the sort of relationship that we have of respectful relations between humans. But I'm going to say, why don't we have that relationship with the natural world as well? This doesn't have to be anti-scientific, and it doesn't have to be idolatrous either. So I am a, a, a Christian and I worship uh, the Christian God, but I do not worship anything else. And yet, if I go to gather fruit in the wild, which I do frequently, I will say thank you to the tree that I've taken fruit from. I don't think of this as at all odd, because I would say thank you to the greengrocer that I buy fruit from. I'm not worshiping the tree and I'm not worshiping the greengrocer. And yet, there is a personality there which I would like to be respectful of because I have just taken its fruit. Um, again, and it's not anti-scientific either. There's nothing wrong with saying that this person is a person, but you can also study their physiology if, it chooses, if you choose. 
Um, so I'm not anti-scientific, neither am I anti-religious. Um, I would like to um, just engage now slightly with a few very concrete examples of what I mean but when I say that our, our culture, which includes our architecture, derives uh, from nature. Um, I have um, studied a, a great deal of the works of uh, the, the Hungarian architect Mokovets, Mokovets Imre. Um, I was particularly struck by his research into Hungarian building terms, um, which he, from which he derived many ideas of zoomorphism. So many of the Hungarian building terms, such as gerinc, which means uh, a spine, also means the ridge of a roof, or a sány, which means a, a wing is also the wing of a building. You'll also notice that occurs in English. I wondered what happens if, in my own culture of English culture, what would happen if I looked at the history of building terms? And I don't think that anybody has done this before, but I'm delighted to be contradicted if they have. Um, and I found, pleasingly enough, that not only were many English building terms based on parts of the, particularly the human body, um, and therein lies a whole story of, of uh, anthropomorphism in, in architecture. But there's also a very great number which seem to be um, based on landscape terms as well. Um, now, there's a great sensitivity in, in place names and in old languages of the British Isles, Old English as well as Old Celtic languages, into the landscape itself. And yet there seems to be a crossover. So, for instance, I'm going to look at the word column, uh, which is from the Latin collis, uh, which means a hill. Uh, now, this is not exactly a hill, this is a sea stack, again in Orkney, um, and yet uh, I'm going to draw some parallels between this and the column, again, of an Oxfordshire church. Uh, let us look at the word for uh, ceiling, uh, from the Latin chylum, cognate with celestial, and of course here is a ceiling, again in an Oxfordshire church, and I'm just going to zoom in slightly further, a particularly beautiful piece of design where the stars are not geometrically arranged, but actually arranged of the stars in the sky. Here's another example. We're going to talk about the word beam. And of course, if you know German, then you will know that this is cognate with the German word baum, or indeed Dutch, boom. Um, here is an English oak, as I say, very twisty, growing it by itself in the forest. Um, and here is what we can do with twisted, curved oak. This is at Stokesy Castle in Shropshire. As a last example, perhaps one of my favorites, we'll look at the word floor. Uh, there's a low German word, vloor, which means meadow. And I think this is rather fine. Um, <clears throat> so there are many other words. I'd like to uh, digress further, but unfortunately time will not allow for that. Um, but nevertheless, it is not only, of course, in, in English terms, but it's a common finding of studies of vernacular architecture that people appear to need to invite the world into their house. We will say make the house into a microcosm of the world, of the landscape surrounding it. There seems to be a great, uh, a great degree of health in that, and here I am back at my, I think this is what we ought to be doing, maybe not what we are doing, and please disagree if you wish. Um, there is a distinct reliance in this poetry of architecture on real materials, and it's sometimes odd that people think of material as something which is gross or unconscious, but I refer back to my ideas of personality in the natural world, that I think we can have a real uh, relationship with these, that in some way um, the material here is infused with the spiritual. Um, and there's, again, a, a very common theme in vernacular architecture, um, and I would also draw for the theologians amongst us the ideas of the Trinity um, and uh, the Incarnation, uh, which is all about the spiritual coming down into the material. That was controversial, and please come and challenge me later if you wish. It is also no surprise to me that, um, that modern science has started to become extremely interested um, in the fractal nature of reality. For if uh, we have different forms which are repeated at wildly different scales, um, and I wonder if this taps into some universal understanding where we wish to make the microcosm of the landscape into our houses, again on wildly different scales, and yet somehow this has great health for us. Uh, this is, for instance, ice fronds on a car uh, in a deep frost. Um, these look like uh, living fronds. They're not. They're volcanic uh, rocks from Yorkshire. Um, and again, you can see how, how similar this and this and, uh, and the frond of a fern would be. And yet, why do these forms arise just like this? They're not, in, in a sense, they're not at all related to each other. And yet, the universe we live in wishes us to pay attention to these forms. Um, by way of an example, or two examples, to round off the talk, and thank you very much for listening so far, um, I would like to, to, to return, really, to architecture and forget these beautiful fronds, as lovely as they are. 
I wonder, if we look at language, returning once again to language, uh, as what I've called an organic construct, that is something which has arisen entirely by humans being conscious and making up words, and yet uh, uh, with no one designer who tries to direct the whole course of it. Um, we look at any particular human language which has grown naturally, and we, we can learn it, but we can learn all of its quirks. And it's the quirks which I'm particularly interested in. Why on earth do we have uh, one language like this and one language like that? If we tried to make it up by ourselves and just sat in a room and thought, I'm going to write a language, and you could come up with all sorts of quirks, and yet they would just be whimsical and meaningless and really not very useful, and yet in a real language they seem to have immense value. I would like to understand how, if we translate into architecture, how can we, as architects, sitting in an office and designing something, avoid that charge of whimsy and say, well, actually, I did this just because I felt I liked it. It's, it's not about feeling that you liked it, but we need to tap into the forms, tap into the contexts, and tap into the sources of what vernacular architecture can be to give it those wonderful quirks which are not simply whimsical. Um, there have been attempts at this sort of engagement, this sort of understanding in modern times. As an English architect, again, I make no apology, um, I can only refer to the most recent attempt in England, which would be perhaps rather loose term, the arts and crafts movement. Um, I'm going to remember our spectrum of uh, culture being from the more natural to the less natural. The arts and crafts architects were very much interested in the end of the spectrum, which is very close to uh, natural, which is unprocessed raw materials. I advise you to read about them in, in Ruskin, who gets a great deal of uh, pleasure of writing from those. Uh, let us start with stone and earth. Uh, you can more or less just dig it out of the ground and put it into a wall. Um, or moving on to timber, it's usually sawn, but that's about it. Brick is burnt in a kiln, as is lime, but there we go, it is fairly obviously clay. We can move into concrete, which is really starting to look very alien to me at any rate. Metal, which we use very sparingly, if at all, because it, you have to, once you've got it out of the ore um, it, from in which it has lain for uh, millennia, it is uh, quite a job. Um, and moving through glass and even into plastic, and I think we're, when we get to plastic, we say this is not a natural material. I always encourage you to ask why. It's, surely it's made out of oil. It's made out of the tiny creatures of... Uh, tiny bodies of creatures that lived uh, several million years ago, and yet it doesn't feel right. Don't know how to put it better than that. Anyway, the, uh, the arts and crafts architects were certainly at the natural end of that spectrum. I'm going to show you two. I think these are two of the finest buildings in 20th century Britain. Uh, the first is a, a, a library. It's a memorial library at the School of Beedales in Hampshire. Um, it is exactly as you see it. Everything there is doing a job. To me, it looks very much like in, in the tradition of the Isled Barn, of, of the English tradition. Uh, and here is an example of an Isled Barn, just to uh, give that comparison. Uh, this is a barn at Great Coxwell, but you can see how we have, excuse me, I'll leave the microphone. Uh, we have the pillars here upholding the roof. The roof extends below those and forms a great, uh, as I say, this is the aisle and this is the main space. The sharp-eyed amongst you will notice that this is not, in fact, built in the English tradition. It was built for a Cistercian abbey in Oxfordshire, uh, but is built actually by French carpenters. Uh, but uh, uh, enough of that later. Uh, back to Beedells. This place does look like an Isled Barn. It never was an Isled Barn. It was built in about, I'm going to say, 1902, I believe. Um, and it's, yet it seems to lend itself to the function of a library rather, uh, rather well. Um, here are the bays in the Isled Barn. Uh, each bay is a study area for the students at the school. Um, and here, perhaps, we can also see um, tapping into those vernacular sources, not simply the Isled Barn and the craftsmanship of the timber, but also the great oriel windows of Cambridge and Oxford colleges or of uh, great houses, for instance, such as this, a beautiful s space set aside um, from the main uh, business of the hall. So certainly craftsmanship is used to its best advantage in this building. Um, it, it, as I said to you, it, almost everything looks like it ought to look, looks like it has been built that way, because that is what there is. So we have timber, we have nails, we have bricks, that's it. It's a very simple building. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I think the, the, the point about this is about the builder who actually made it. Um, it's often credited to the architect Ernest Jimpson. Um, but he worked very closely with this man here, uh, Geoffrey Lupton. Um, they attempted 
to get so close to the building work that they found that they had to do the work themselves. There was no contractor in this building. These are the men who actually built it. Um, and that is part of my point about the Arts and Crafts building. Not only did they want to engage with the materials in sense of at the, the natural end of the cultural spectrum, but they wanted to get their hands onto them to really understand what that context of the building was. If you want to get into further details, perhaps you can see this not as a reconstruction of an Isled barn, um, and again, for those who know their, know their English timber framing, and I'm delighted to talk about it more outside this lecture, um, that this um, does appear to be a, a, really a continuation and quite an innovation in timber construction, um, as I noticed on my visit there, um, because it contains not only a crown plate, uh, the central element, um, which is a very early form of uh, construction in England, but also uh, purlins, um, which uh, are on either side of the crown plate. Now, I have not seen an example like this before. I may be wrong, and I'm going to talk to Adrian, I'm sure, about it afterwards. Um, but certainly, they were not afraid of innovation while working within this tradition. And that, again, going back to my example of language, um, is exactly what humans do. It's constraints and choices within those constraints. The final example which I'll show you, um, a big pardon, is a church in Herefordshire, also in, in England, this time in the West. At first glance, this might look like a normal parish church. Um, almost every village in England has a parish church, which is usually at least 700 years old, if not more. Um, it's an immensely rich heritage uh, that we have that we do not make the most of. I say at first glance um, because if we look uh, more closely, um, it may become immediately obvious that this is not a normal parish church. It was, in fact, built in 1902, again, by two men, W.R. Letherby and Randall Wells, who themselves, both described as architects, but both wished to be as close as they could possibly be to the materials and the making of this church. Um, well, let's look slightly more closely at some of the door hinges. You will never see another door hinge like this, and certainly not on a historic church. They were made by a local blacksmith who was given exactly all the, all, all the changefulness, all the freedom that he needed uh, to be able to make a new, a new form of hinge. And yet, it is doing exactly what iron always wants to do. Um, so, my final point, if I may say so, and we're returning back once more to our morals of the case and what ought to be, and please disagree if you wish. Um, I think that deriving from nature all these cultural artefacts that we have, whether we're talking about language or architecture or anything else, can be a lens through which we can truly see the world. They can also obscure the world but I think they're one part of an invaluable uh, method we have of truly seeing the world for what it is. I'd like to quote once more from a, a poet, uh, Robert McFarlane, uh, who works in Cambridge. Um, he's, he writes a great deal about language, but perhaps the following could be as much about architecture as it is about words. Um, he's written about the, the disappearing of words which relate to nature from the English language and from the common uh, lexicon of, of English words. We need now, he says urgently, a counter-desecration phrase book that would comprehend the world, a glossary of enchantment for the whole earth, which would allow nature to talk back and would help us to listen. I wonder if our buildings could do the same. In one last parallel with language, many of you know the works of Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, he was a professor at Oxford as well as a writer, which many people perhaps do not know. He was immensely knowledgeable and he had a deep understanding of northern cultures, not only English, but also Welsh, German, and Finnish, and many others. He was uh, particularly interested in philology, the history of words, and indeed he helped write the, uh, part, the W section of the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, we come up with the idea of an asterisk word. This is a word reconstructed from philological laws. Sorry, you, yes? Um, Am I over? You need to stop to Okay. Out. Okay, I beg your pardon. I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll take 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Um, an asterisk word reconstructed from philological laws, from which we can, we can be fairly sure it did exist, but was never written down. Um, Tolkien's achievement was that, in his literary works, was to write what we called an asterisk poem. This is a poem which contingently was not written long ago, but could have been. And that, I believe, derives from his immense engagement um, with uh, with the context of the history of what he was talking about. So I would ask, can we make an asterisk building? Can we go back to the woods? 
to the quarries, to the mason's bench, can we engage once more with the material, and not just the material, but the whole life of what gave us this strong and powerful vernacular architecture, and not be architects anymore, or at least be only partly architects. Um, I think that we know that we are natural, but I think that our culture can reflect nature to such an extent that our architecture can, and indeed ought to be, much more like the vernacular. Thank you very much. Thank you.